I'm so happy that Alexander talked about uh, e-sports because um, uh, our next speaker is somebody who knows a lot about uh, e-sports. It is His Royal Highness Prince Faisal bin Badr bin Sultan Al Saud, and he is the president of the Saudi Arabian Federation for Electronics and Intellectual Sports. Please give His Royal Highness a warm round of applause, please. See, what a nice segue that Alexander just did to you, huh? That was, that was nice of him. Um, first of all, Your Royal Highness, I want to congratulate you with all the hard work uh, that you have done uh, to promote uh, esports and gaming and game development here in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. And uh, I know that you are an avid gamer yourself. I've heard things like Madden Football, Assassin's Creed, uh, just to mention a few. But, but, uh, what was one of the first games that kind of caught your imagination? Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for having me, and thank you for everyone for, for coming to watch. And uh, the first, I mean, my first console was an Atari. So, you know, playing Pong, and there was a, a game called Loop de Loop, which has uh, got us interested in, to begin with. Um, but the switch, what I never made was that switch from casual gaming to professional esports player which looking at the numbers now, I wish I had started a little earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Great, yes, because obviously, uh, and I don't know, don't know how much you are in the audience familiar with uh, eSports and the growth of eSports, uh, so maybe you could give it some insights into why is eSports so suddenly so interesting and, and what are some of the growth potential that, that, uh, that you see coming from eSports? Well, um, I heard, I was at a, a, one of the uh, task forces earlier about champions and someone said in there something that really caught my attention, saying this, this hype about esports is not really hype. It's just people who don't play games have realized what other, the rest of the world is doing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, it's grown very quickly. And it's an industry that is the industry of youth. It is the sport of youth. And one of the great things about it is it's, it's changed the whole paradigm. So where people were watching sports on TV, now they're watching sports on their computers, on their phones. Um, and it's changed, it's a shift in mentality. People are no longer watching movies and things on, on TV anymore. You're either going for the cinema experience or you want to watch your streaming, your Netflix and so on. Um, and for us as a country with, I mean, everyone knows the numbers, 70% under the age of 30. And what people don't realize is we have 90%, over 90% cell phone penetration, over 90% internet, internet penetration. So you couple that with the, the population that's already there. And it's just, it's prime ground for esports to grow. I already feel a little bit old when I talk <laughs> about esports. I mean, you know, what's, what's happening? So tra traditional sports, you talk about esports as a spectator sport. Uh, how, how, is, how is that kind of changing this whole sports landscape? And, and well, one of the things I get asked quite often is, why is esports a sport? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and my is it a sport? <laughs> is, um, my reply is, there was one of the things that I use as, as uh, my point of proof. There was a study done by a sports science university in Germany. I think, if I'm not mistaken, based out of Hamburg. And they said, during esports events, when those players are on stage, their heart rates reach levels of 160 to 180, which is equivalent to a marathon runner. They have cortisol levels in their blood, equivalent to F1 drivers. They have, you know, the mental stress, you know, playing in front of a crowd of sometimes 15 plus thousand. Uh, all of these are equivalent to the stresses on someone's body as they're playing a traditional sport. And so one of the things that we tell people is we, our professionals, the professional esports players, have to focus on their mental, their physical, and their social health as to be a complete athlete the same way any other athlete does. And, uh, and that's something we stress very strongly here. And I know, um, you know my partners in other federations are doing the same. However, what differentiates esports to traditional sports is the engagement, the fan engagement. You, if you walk into you know, a football stadium, you, know, you have 
your, your team, you have your fans, you have all of these things. However, with eSports, you have a personal interaction. You can sometimes play against these guys online. When you can go to tournaments, they, they, they know who you are by your online name. When you join their community, there's shout outs to particular people, specific people. Oh, so and so just joined uh, you know, our, our group, you know, let's welcome him. And these are people with, we're talking about a million followers on YouTube, uh, whether that's in Saudi or, or, or abroad. So it's, it's a completely different paradigm when you talk about the fan engagement, and that's something completely new. So you touched on something there that I found interesting because uh, when I think about gaming, I think about this uh, uh, most likely guy stuck in his basement uh, <laughs> playing all by himself and sports is supposed to bring people together. So togetherness in eSports, is that uh, a thing that, as well? That image of eSports is, is completely outdated at this point. The, the image of someone sitting in their basement by themselves, you know, overweight, watching TV, no longer applies to the professional eSports players and the, the model that we want for, for eSports professionals. Um, these are guys who are um, social. They're part of a team. Usually there's a lot of these games are six or more players. Uh, you have a coaching staff, you have analytics, you have a community, you have a fan base, you have um, uh, media days, you have the same things that you go through as any other sport, and they're going through the same training that you're going through as any other sport. And it's that change in, in mentality that has happened, that has shifted on an athlete level. And what we're trying now is to shift that mentality on a, a parental level. Sometimes parents don't quite understand, uh, but also shift that as a public perception. Once people start to see this, as its own individual sport, uh, I think things will change very quickly. So you already talked about a, a few of the barriers, uh, some of the societal barriers, but, but uh, what does need to happen to make this industry uh, thrive, not just in Saudi Arabia, but, uh, but globally? Well, there's, there's, I mean, so many different things that uh, I could point to here. However, if I had to narrow it down, there's two things that work hand in hand that are new and that are gonna change everything when it comes to esports. One is uh, cloud gaming. And for those who don't understand what cloud gaming is, if you think of the model of Netflix, everything is hosted on an external server. So you no longer need all that data to be on your console or on your computer, which means you no longer need the top computer, the top processor to be able to compete. You can do that on a laptop, on a, 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 a cell phone, on anything you need. And essentially what you're doing is you're putting a command onto what you're doing, but that's being executed on the server. So that all of that process that takes up so much room, so much memory, needs so much speed, is no longer applicable, which evens out the playing field even more. And then you couple that with the advent of 5G. And you know, I mean, we're very lucky in Saudi to have one of the first rollouts of 5G internationally, and we're moving very, very quickly on that. And that's gonna change everything because now it doesn't matter where you are. If you have a fast internet connection at home or not, your 5G connection will give you the equivalency of playing next to someone in the UK or next to someone in the US, whether you're in the same country or not. So cloud computing, 5G, opening up some new exciting uh, technological possibilities. Uh, Absolutely. We had an investment summit, obviously. People will ask <laughs> what are the investment possibilities in, in uh, eSports. Uh, I mean, as an investment, it's, it's an industry that is still in its infancy. So room for investment is all across the board. I mean, just, I mean, as an example in Saudi, I mean, we're not talking about an international scale, if we're talking about just Saudi, we anticipate by 2030 that uh, the esports and gaming industry will be roughly 1% of the GDP of Saudi Arabia, wow. which is over 80 billion riyals, uh, which is no small feat. Yeah. Uh, and that's just within the next 10 years. And people ask me, you know, well, where should we invest? I said, well, you know, there's a whole value chain, whether it's players, teams, um, the industry itself, the creation, game creation, all of these things. However, in my view, there's one, one aspect that kind of pulls them all together, and that is actual physical locations. Because despite what you, the, the previous idea, people want to get together to play. They want that community. They're a very strong community, very close-knit. And they like to get together, whether it's on a, a gamer level, getting to a cafe, a gaming cafe, getting to an area where they can all come together to play, um, or whether it's at a team level, having a place to practice, having a place to have tournaments, at an international level, having a place where you can have host international tournaments. And that's where we're talking about five to 10 to 15,000 people showing up. And also from gaming companies, a location where they can launch their games. And the great thing about having a, a location is, 
I mean, it, it is the sport of youth, which means that as long as people in this world are having children, there will be people coming to your gaming locations. <laughs> So, so is, is, but, but is that a myth, though? How, when, when we're talking about uh, gamers, what, what, is, what, what is the average age, just out of uh, curiosity, because... Um, well, usually, when you're talking about starting to become pro, starting to go yeah. into the pipeline, you're talking about 13. Okay. Uh, but if you're talking about going pro, that's about 16 to about 20 is the prime age for going pro, uh, depending on the game. Some games, you can carry that on to 25 or 30, but usually just physically reaction times, once you get past 20, 21, you're, you can't really compete with some of the, the younger players, which is an absurdly young <laughs> retirement age. <laughs> Please don't kill my dreams there. I thought I had a second <laughs> career going for me. I don't have any, any, any chance as a Danish football player now. I don't have any chance to make it as a professional uh, esports player. That's a shame. Um, could you maybe just talk uh, a little bit about some of the initiatives that, that, that you have uh, done here in, yeah. in, in Saudi Arabia to uh, foster some so of that exciting uh, development within esports? What, what we talk about when we come to esports is it's pretty much a three-pronged attack. One, and what we focused on to begin with, was the professional player, which is our narrow mandate. And for there, what we're talking about is helping our professional players become the best they can be, making sure that they understand what it takes to be a professional. It's not just about gaming. It's about you know, the complete person. It's your physical health, getting the right sleep, getting the right food. Uh, it's about social health, making sure you can handle your team, making sure you can deal with your coaches, you can deal with the situations. Mental health, how do you handle being on stage? The pressures of being a, a member of a team and the pressures that add, as in any other sport. Um, and then as that starts to grow, and that starts, it's already started and it's moving in its, its, its own way in Saudi, we're starting to take a step back and kind of focus on the two other areas. One would be education, teaching the next generation what it means to be a professional. It is these guys who, are, who should be your heroes. Uh, the perfect example of that would be Msaad al Dosri, who's a, our FIFA E World Cup winner, who, as proud as I am for him, winning the World Cup and reaching the final this year, and he narrowly lost in the final. I'm more proud of a story I heard of him from one of his qualifiers, where another player got hurt, uh, was sick, went to the hospital, and during his celebration for winning the qualifier to the World Cup, he actually left his celebrations, took his scarf, which is your, what you get to qualify, left it at this, child, this kid's bedside, um, and apparently this young man was wearing the scarf two days later and so happy about it. Uh, and then the other aspect, so I'm more proud of him yeah. for that than I am for him for winning. And the other aspect, of course, is end of life. Teaching them that the skills you've learned in esports can apply within other industries and within this injury, industry, whether it's commentating, coaching, and so on and so forth. Definitely a very interesting space to keep our eyes on. Thank you so much, Your Royal Highness, for joining us. Thank you very us, much. And we'll see you back uh, very soon. Thank you so much.